I'd like to introduce our moderator, our MEI's own director of the Pakistan Afghanistan Center here at the Middle East Institute, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum. He has um, over 40 years, we'll leave it at 40, uh, experience in uh, the region. He was a distinguished uh, tenured professor at uh, University of Illinois. He served in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, uh, also tracking Pakistan affairs uh, in the Department of State where I first met him. Uh, he briefed me and educated me uh, on my way out to Pakistan in uh, 2001. And now he's uh, fortunately with us here at the Middle East Institute, heading our institute, and he will introduce our distinguished speaker, who has a real task. I just want to say yes, something, please. because uh, as the, um, uh, uh, John Sapko, as the um, uh, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan and Reconstruction, he has to oversee and critique the uh, reconstruction efforts of the U.S. government in Afghanistan. And this is the difficult thing during a war, implementing projects uh, in a wartime situation and at the same time making sure that they are properly managed. Uh, it's a difficult task for both the overseer uh, as it is for the implementer. Uh, it's not a normal situation. So he's been dealing with several challenges. Marvin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> well, welcome. And uh, uh, we're very pleased to be able to continue now the Lou Yu's series that we have uh, had now for better part of, uh, I guess, going on two years or so. And uh, we're looking forward to further further lectures, panels uh, in the near future on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, because both of those countries are just in, inseparable uh, from, so many, from so many perspectives. Uh, our speaker today, I think we're very fortunate to have someone who has uh, been so much in the news uh, because of his efforts here to critique our program, our reconstruction program, his agency's efforts in Afghanistan, and has come forward with uh, a great many uh, areas where he believes that uh, mistakes were made. Uh, uh, some of these have elicited controversy, uh, perhaps naturally, uh, but I believe that his, his background uh, certainly uh, prepared him for this kind of role. Uh, our speaker has had extensive experience in the public sector, in the private sector, and has uh, served uh, as a prosecutor. Uh, and I think that, that probably those skills are become particularly handy when it comes to the kind of inquiries that uh, is necessary uh, in his current performance. Uh, we look forward to his commenting about how he sees our efforts in Afghanistan to date, but especially how he views our, our efforts in reconstruction this year, this transitional year, and going forward from this post-14 when we hope, although with a reduced program, but we still hope that we'll, we'll see is uh, our part here in uh, allowing Afghanistan really to be able to persevere in face of the continuing challenges that it has. So please, please join us. John. Thank you very much for those kind comments. And if I can just put this there and not break anything. Um, I am pleased to be here today. It is a great pleasure. Uh, to discuss some of the lessons learned. And I, I understand that uh, I may be the only thing between you and lunch, so I'll try to be short. Uh, I know I grew up uh, speaking to a lot of groups who had, uh, were armed uh, when I was a former prosecutor and then when I worked for Sam Nunn. So I always knew how to get off stage quickly. So you never want to <laughs> anger people who uh, know how to use weapons and are usually carrying them. But it is a pleasure to be here to talk about 
some of the lessons learned from 12 years of a reconstruction experience in Afghanistan. Uh, it's fitting venue here uh, because for almost 70 years, as you well know, the Middle East Institute has dedicated itself to the critical mission of being an unbiased source of information and analysis on the Middle East and South Asia. The Middle East Institute's commitment to objectivity, intellectual rigor, and public service has helped both policymakers and the public with critical knowledge of and firsthand encounters with the peoples of the Middle East. I want to thank the Institute's President, Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain, the Institute's Chairman of the Board, uh, uh, Richard Clark, who I've known for years and uh, 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 here, and I'm glad to see he's got a book coming out. I'm looking forward to buying that. So it's a probably illegal endorsement for Richard Clark's uh, new novel, but I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, but I want to thank them and everyone else for inviting me to be here and, and for me to play my small role uh, in your organization's important mission. I also want to thank the kind comments of uh, Dr. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum, uh, the director of the Center for Pakistan Studies, for his leadership, his highly respected and nonpartisan work. And I commented to him just last week, uh, colleagues from my office went out and spoke to his successor out at the university and met with uh, the students. So oh, uh, a great uh, uh, resource there that you helped create. Um, it's important to realize that the United States has provided over $103 billion to build up the Afghan government, its security force, to bolster the Afghan's economy, Afghanistan's economy, and improve the Afghan quality of life. Now let's put that in context. What does $103 billion mean? That is more money than we have spent on reconstruction for any single country in the history of the United States. More than we spent on Germany, England, or Japan uh, after World War II. Uh, another way to put it in context, that's more money we're spending this year on reconstruction in Afghanistan than we are spending on Pakistan, Egypt, and Israel combined. Now many people, and this is what's so surprising to me, that many people in Washington believe at the end of this year, America's longest war and our involvement in Afghanistan will come to an end. Now, by December, there may be only a few thousand troops in Afghanistan. Yet despite that drawdown of US and coalition forces, our mission there is far from over. With almost $18 billion authorized, appropriated, and still in the pipeline, not yet spent, and oh, up to six to eight billion dollars per year promised annually for at least 10 years to come, Afghanistan reconstruction should be, and I hope is, an issue that is relevant to every policymaker and every U.S. taxpayer. The Office of Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, the office that I lead, called SIGAR, uh, was established in 2008 to protect that significant investment. I've only been running it for two years. Actually, my anniversary of appointment by the president comes up next month. Uh, since its creation, we have developed a large body of work focused on US reconstruction efforts. This work... Uh, has involved every facet of the SIGAR organization. We have 200 some uh, employees. We've issued over 118 audit and inspection reports, 23 quarterly reports to Congress, 19 congressional testimonies, and many other special publications, as well as hundreds of indictments and convictions of individuals. We are a law enforcement agency uh, in addition to being an audit agency. Taken individually, all of this body, as well as the reports uh, prepared by my colleagues at GAO and the other inspector generals, reveal concrete instances of waste, fraud, and abuse. But taken together, they also reveal some lessons that we can use to strengthen and improve U.S. government operations there, not only in Afghanistan, but hopefully for future contingency operations. 
that is what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I want to focus on four lessons learned in particular that are especially relevant this year, this year of transition. The first lesson I'd like to focus on is that we must consider a country's ability to sustain the assistance we provide. The second is since reconstruction in a conflict zone is inherently risky, that risk must be properly mitigated through aggressive management and oversight. The third lesson I want to focus on is that all reconstruction efforts must have clearly articulated goals and a sound way to honestly measure their progress. And lastly, the fourth lesson I want to focus on is that we must consider and we must ensure that a country's long-term economic self-sufficiency is taken into consideration so that that country, whether it's Afghanistan or the next country we do this, does not remain dependent on foreign assistance. Let me start with the first lesson, and that is reconstruction programs must take into account the recipient country's ability to operate and sustain the assistance we provide. Now with a per capita gross domestic product of $687, Afghanistan is one of the world's poorest countries. The work of SIGAR and others has shown that the sheer size of the U.S. government's reconstruction efforts has placed both a financial and operational burden on the Afghan economy that is simply cannot manage by itself. The $103 billion that the U.S. government has already committed to rebuild Afghanistan is noteworthy when compared to other U.S. foreign aid investments, as I mentioned before. But it is staggering when you consider it in the context of the Afghan economy. For instance, Afghanistan's GDP in 2012 was approximately $20 billion. That same year, U.S. reconstruction alone amounted to $15 billion, 75% of Afghanistan's GDP. And I caution, I'm only talking about U.S. reconstruction. I'm not talking about our other allies' amount of reconstruction, nor am I talking about the amount of money spent by the U.S. and our allies in fighting the war, which is even more significant. In addition, Sustaining this assistance could overwhelm the governments of Afghanistan's budget. Last year, the government of Afghanistan raised nearly $2 billion in legitimate taxes. We have a problem with the Afghans raising illegal taxes, which has been raised in a number of our reports. But legitimate taxes, they raise approximately $2 billion. They are projecting $2.4 billion, but recent reports says have told, uh, have have mentioned and probably uh, that goal is going to be doubtful for this year. Now unfortunately they raised two billion the budget for the government of Afghanistan is 7.6 billion per year. Without donor contributions the Afghan government will not be able to meet this shortfall which will have serious consequences. For example, the latest independent assessment by the Center for Naval Analysis concludes that the Afghan National Security Force will, excuse me, Afghan National Security Force will be needed, you know, they will need 373,000 members of that force, which is significantly larger than the current plans. This would cost five to six billion dollars per year. At this level, if the Afghan government were to dedicate all its domestic revenue to sustaining their army and police, they still can only pay for one-third of the cost. Moreover, all other costs, from paying civil servants to maintaining roads, schools, hospitals, and non-military infrastructure, would also have to come from international donors. Now, while paying for Afghanistan's security forces will be challenging, the cost of ongoing non-military development aid is also contributing to the government's growing fiscal debt gap. 
Each new development project that the U.S. and the other international donors fund increases overall operation and maintenance costs for the Afghan government. This adds additional pressure to that limited Afghan operating budget. Let's take, for example, the energy sector. The problem of planning and implementing programs without considering cost and feasibility is strikingly evident in that sector. SIGAR's work indicates that the Afghans cannot afford to pay for most of the electricity that the U.S. reconstruction effort has managed to turn on over the last 12 years. In January 2010, SIGAR issued an audit report on U.S. aid's uh, efforts to build a 105 megawatt Kabul power plant. The Afghan government had committed to commercializing it and commercializing the operations to cover its operations and fuel costs within one year of its creation. However, as we learned, it didn't happen. SIGAR found that the Afghan government will require significant subsidies for years to come to cover the costs of the plant we built for them. In July 2012, SIGAR issued a report on the Afghan Infrastructure Fund, a fund that was used by USAID and U.S. Forces Afghanistan, or US-4A, uh, to handle major infrastructure projects. Many of these projects are in the energy sector, including two significant initiatives, including two high-power voltage transmission networks and the Kandahar Bridging Solution, which, just so you know, the Kandahar Bridging Solution is to cover the cost of the fuel for the diesel uh, generators we have in Kandahar provided by the U.S. Army, since the Afghans can't afford the fuel themselves. SIGAR found that although USAID and US 4A prepared sustainment plans for these projects, unbelievably, the plans did not include any analysis of the cost related to sustaining those plans. It is questionable whether the Afghan entities charged with financing these projects, therefore, can afford them. So, Unless the U.S. government or other international donors keep subsidizing the fuel for the generators, let's say, in Kandahar, the lights will go out in 2015. In the interim, I learned on my last trip that to help offset the gap in power generation in Kandahar, the U.S. government and the Afghan Ministry of Energy have come up with a new plan. We call it the bridging solution to the bridging solution. And this plan involves a solar generating plant as well as a new hydroelectric plant at the Dalla Dam. Now, although I am encouraged and I commend USAID and DABS, which is the Ministry of Energy, for coming up with plan, but I am concerned about whether that in itself is fiscally sustainable. The bottom line is this. Apart from possibly obtaining some short-term gratitude for the donors' reconstruction efforts, there would seem to be little benefit in setting up a project or a program that the Afghans cannot or will not sustain once international forces depart and international aid is ended or declines. And that is the concern. Part of this was to win the hearts and minds of the Afghans for the central government. Is that winning the hearts and minds if the power goes out in Kandahar? The second lesson that it seems obvious to everyone, but I need to repeat, is reconstruction in a conflict zone is inherently risky. Accordingly, we have to mitigate that risk. As one of the world's most impoverished, insecure, and corrupt countries, Afghanistan presents extraordinary challenges to those in aid and state and DOD 
committed to help to address its very serious problems. And we recognize how difficult this is. The U.S. and other donors must not only worry about the safety of all those who work in Afghanistan on their behalf, they must also take extraordinary measures to try to safeguard the funds we have entrusted to the Afghans and used in Afghanistan from fraud, waste, and abuse. As the U.S. and coalition forces draw down, security requirements have put and will continue to put key re reconstruction projects off limits. For example, let's take the Kajaki Dam, the famous Kajaki Dam that we have been working on since the 1950s. It has taken longer than it took the pharaohs to build the uh, uh, pyramids, but we're still working on that third turbine. The Marines withdrew from Kajaki in 2013, making it almost impossible for any U.S. government employee to visit the Kajaki project uh, on a regular basis. There are some exceptional capabilities we have, but not on a regular basis could we get there. Last year, SIGAR determined that no more than 20% of Afghanistan will be accessible to U.S. management and oversight personnel by the end of the transition period. And that's probably being quite generous. It's probably going to be a lot less. The question is this. How do we mitigate the risk created by this inability to kick the tires of reconstruction programs and projects? Security requirements are already affecting management and oversight in a negative way of numerous large and small projects. Last month, SIGAR issued an inspection report on Camp Monitor, an Afghan National Army base largely built by U.S. foray. When SIGAR inspectors visited the site, they found that the contractor had run out of funds. The work was unfinished, and as a result, the camp was unusable. Moreover, because of the camp's location would soon be inaccessible to U.S. personnel, U.S. foray had trouble finding a contractor to finish the job. As a result, in November of 2013, the Department of Defense gave $1.2 million check to the Ministry of Defense to complete the construction of Camp Monitor. At this point, we were told that DOD's oversight of the project would cease. DOD told us that once the funds are quote unquote donated to the Afghan government, the Afghans may use those funds without further coordination with the U.S. Department of Defense. Now we strongly disagreed and we still disagree with the notion that once funds, U.S. taxpayer funds, are committed as direct assistance, U.S. government stewardship over those funds ends. We totally disagree with that. Thankfully for us, and I think the American taxpayer, U.S. foray overruled those officials and agreed with us to help minimize the risk of continuing to engage the Afghan government until construction is complete. I commend Major General Jeff Colt and U.S. foray for their commitment to monitoring this project. But this example highlights the need to mitigate the inherent risk or additional risk, I should say, of on-budget assistance, where funds go to the Afghan ministries directly. We, and that means not just us, but the entire U.S. government, has to ensure that the Afghan entities receiving these funds have the capability to manage and account for the money. We must also ensure that the U.S. government and other donors have adequate controls and conditions to ensure that the Afghan ministries themselves use those funds as intended. And there must be real consequences for failing to do so. Ultimately, what this means is we and our allies must have the courage to risk saying no to the Afghans for particular projects or for particularly ministries if they don't implement those safeguards or don't let us visit, and by us I mean not just the, the auditors, not just the investigators, but the US aid employees, the State Department employees, and DOD employees to monitor and run those programs effectively. Let me give you another graphic example of what happens when we don't get this right. 
In late 2013, the Afghans began using a hospital built by the U.S. military, military in Parwan, Parwan Province. SIGAR inspected this hospital last November, and we found that the water system, the sewer system, the electrical system, the heating system were incomplete, had failed the contractual requirement, were in need of repairs, and also that the hospital had not followed the uh, proposals there and had been built on a seismic fault area, and there was actually was a major crack in the hospital. Now, in fact, they needed repairs. There was actually no clean running water. Uh, newborn babies were being washed in the river nearby. Each room of the hospital had only one light bulb, and there was little electricity to use it since the electrical system wasn't properly installed. The roof leaked. There was mold and mildew everywhere. In other words, the hospital lacked some of the most basic necessities of a viable medical facility and, very, and obviously violated the contractual uh, requirements uh, put in by U.S. for it. Now, problem was, we turned it over and said it was okay. So either no one from the U.S. government had visited the hospital or somebody in the U.S. military has a very strange attitude of what constitutes a effective and functioning medical facility. This was a serious failure of oversight. All of this was graphically depicted by an NBC TV crew, which got out to that hospital, even though it was beyond the bubble, and filmed a child being operated on with a rusty uh, pliers. Actually, they, were, they did the operation on film. Um, and again, being treated by, we don't know who, but they were using water coming out of the local stream. Now, there are many excuses, many, many excuses for inadequate oversight and failure to mitigate the risks of working in a war zone. Lack of security tops the list. Then there's the high turnover of U.S. military and civilian personnel and the lack of an integrated system to track reconstruction projects. I mean, I, I, as an aside, we are 12 years into this. We still don't have one single list of all of the projects we did in Afghanistan. You cannot find that list anywhere in the U.S. government. Now, you talk about adding to the complexity. We don't even know where we spent the money. How do we know if it was wisely spent? But ultimately, we have found that the biggest cause of the inadequate oversight in Afghanistan may well be a lack of commitment. Despite promises and statements to the media and Congress, oversight is still not viewed as mission critical by some bureaucrats responsible for carrying out this important mission and protecti of protecting our tax dollars. The third lesson I want to briefly discuss is that large reconstruction efforts must have clearly articulated goals and a sound way to measure their progress. Taking a strategic approach to program design helps ensure that a program is based on a sound plan that can achieve results that matter. Unfortunately, there sometimes appears to be a gap between policymakers in Washington and those who implement the policies in Afghanistan. Strategic plans must be linked to individual projects. When they are not, agencies risk working at counter purposes, spending money on frivolous endeavors, or failing to coordinate efforts in order to maximize impact. While it is widely acknowledged in government and industry that strategic planning is a must, SIGAR has repeatedly found that it has often been ignored in Afghanistan. For example, after many years of reconstruction effort, SIGAR noted that the U.S. government has never articulated a clear anti-corruption strategy in Afghanistan. They started one back in 2009, 2010, but it has never been completed. We reported that last year for the second time. The importance of clearly connecting program goals, objectives, and outputs was underscored most notably 
um, in correspondence between my agency and USAID and the Departments of Defense and State last year. We asked each of the agencies to provide us information and a list of the 10 most and 10 least successful of their projects and programs in Afghanistan. You would think that would be simple. You would think that would be an opportunity to give notice to the world of the great successes. We wanted to learn from the successes as well as the failures. We're finding so many failures, we were looking for some great successes. Unfortunately, the agencies didn't answer the question. They did answer, but they just provided anecdotal tidbits of health has improved, security has improved, education has improved, women's issues have improved, but none of the agencies could show any of their programs directly contributing to any of the anecdotal improvements. Again, this is after 12 years. You would think somebody would know what worked. Now again, I don't do policy. I'm the guy who comes later. Think of me as after the automobile accident on the highway. We're the guys who go out and draw the little lines and all that. You would think the people who are the implementers, the policy designers, would know what works and what doesn't, or what should have worked and what didn't. Now, in the face of shrinking budgets, and new mission priorities that our government is facing and our Congress is facing, this is critically important if we want to do better in Afghanistan. We need to be able to identify programs that are no longer helping us, as well as identify those programs that have been greatly successful. We need to rack and stack, because the clock is ticking. If we are going to get the biggest bang for our reconstruction buck, and protect the biggest bang from cuts by Congress, mistaken changes of administrative policies, you need to know what works. You need to have a reliable way to show exactly how the money being spent is making the difference we set out to make, going back to those goals, going back to those that planning. This leads me to the last lesson. I know you guys all want to eat, so I'm sorry I'm keeping you away from that. And I think it may be the, actually the most important lesson. And that is for every large reconstruction effort, we have to plan and help ensure the, the country's economic self-sufficiency. One of the overarching goals of reconstruction in Afghanistan is to develop the foundation for a viable economy. Because in time, foreign aid will be reduced and Afghanistan will have to assume a greater and greater control over its future. However, what we have found and my colleagues in the other agencies have found to do oversight is the U.S. and the international donors have not put enough emphasis on this key objective. To steal a phrase from General Dunford and General Allen when I talked to them in the military, it has not been mission critical. It will likely be many, many years until Afghanistan can generate enough revenue to support the kind of government and security forces the United States and its allies have helped it build over the last 12 years. Most experts agree that Afghanistan must tap its own natural resources, such as copper, iron ore, oil and gas, to generate the income to replace that foreign assistance. Although the extractive sector has contributed less than 2% to the country's GDP to date, many have estimated there are trillions of dollars of mineral deposits in Afghanistan. However, Afghanistan lacks the capacity to fully develop this sector. We at SIGAR have cautioned that substantial revenues from natural resources may not be realized anytime soon because of the considerable infrastructure investment required and up to now, mainly ignored. In addition, new mineral laws needed to, need to be uh, put in place to protect the Afghan resources, encourage investors, and align regulations to international best practices. Now, assuming there is revenue generation, there has to be revenue collection. And in Afghanistan, revenue generation is itself challenging. 
we must ensure that the Afghan government can not only generate the revenue, but actually collects it. As General Allen testified last week, corruption is more serious in Afghanistan than the insurgency. And for example, what I have been told on every trip is that corruption is really the big issue. And it particularly is a big issue affecting the US, affecting Afghan customs processes and revenue raised from the customs and also from the minerals. During my visit to Afghanistan this quarter, I toured the forward operating base at the Torkham Gate border crossing, which is on the border with the Pakistan. 80% of all Afghan customs revenue is generated there. I was told that when U.S. mentors and observers are not present, revenue collection falls. This was not encouraging, especially as the crossing will soon be outside the reach by U.S. personnel because the U.S. military is closing down that forward operating base. If we are serious about ensuring Afghanistan's economic self-sufficiency, the U.S. government's allies need to reassess access to locations such as this, uh, locations that are critical for revenue generation for the Afghan government. We need to manage the drawdown and transition so that we repla replace our resources in the most critical areas to ensure revenue collection at the border, as well as if the mineral sector is developed. At the same time, Afghanistan must also get its financial house in order to handle the hoped for economic activity from mining or from the border by making its banking sector more reliable. The 2010 collapse of the largest private bank in Afghanistan, the Kabul Bank, exemplifies this point. It shows how the patronage system and the failure to prosecute people of gross fraud and abuse is undermining the Afghan economy and putting future development efforts at risk. I'm not gonna dwell on the Kabul Bank scandal. I think we all have heard enough about it. Almost a billion dollars were stolen from what they called a Ponzi scheme. Uh, Almost over 90% of that money went to 19 individuals and companies, and there was very little effort to collect the money. To make matters worse, recently, the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, which is an international intergovernmental body that sets the standards required to combat money laundering, terrorist findings, and other threats, downgraded the Afghan Afghanistan status. It said Afghanistan has not made enough progress on addressing anti-money laundering deficiencies post the Kabul Bank. If Afghanistan does not sh show sufficient improvements, such as passing an internationally accepted anti-money laundering law, FATF will probably blacklist Afghanistan at its next meeting next month joining only nine other countries on that blacklist. This could dramatically affect negatively the Afghan banking, the Afghan's banking relationship around the world and hinder international aid and international investment going through Afghan banks. Now for a long time, Afghanistan has not taken this issue seriously. We hope the new government will. Getting this right is critical to Afghans' economic future. The longer it takes to establish a trustworthy banking sector, functioning customs houses, and viable mining sector, the longer Afghanistan will need to rely on the international community for financial assistance. Before closing, I want to acknowledge that implementing, managing, and overseeing reconstruction programs is challenging. It's not easy, it's dangerous. And I'm proud every time I meet our State Department, USAID and DOD officials who are working daily in a dangerous environment there. No government agency will do it perfectly. No government agency around the world has done it perfectly. But I think we can do it better. And I think we particularly can do it better if we apply the four lessons I have just discussed. I think they will, if we follow those, we will help ensure a meaningful and long-lasting benefit to our experience in Afghanistan. With the military drawdown coming to a close, it is time to stop for a second and reassess. 
and make sure we are doing the most good with the time and resources we have remaining. The alternatives are not acceptable, not to us, not to our allies, and certainly not to the Afghans. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for uh, the clarity and, uh, uh, and vigor in which you pre made this presentation. You know, I think it's clear that a case has been made, strong case has been made, for how we probably allotted too much in the way of resources, poor, and we spent the money poorly. There's a concern, though, and I'm sure you, you share this, that with the kind of rigorous oversight that you've provided here, that we don't allow this necessarily to become an excuse for saying, well, then maybe we shouldn't spend anything at all, that maybe we ought to cut free of Afghanistan and what we have invested. So the question comes down to, we've made an enormous investment there. Uh, can we make a far smaller investment and make it more wisely? Uh, but to make no investment at all, certainly I think you'd agree with me, would undermine everything that we have done thus far. And we have, after all, for all the things that we've done poorly, there are a few things that we have done right. Uh, so with that, with that, if you'll allow me that commentary, yeah, because I think we, we are concerned here that, uh, that the important work that you've done not become an excuse for simply washing our hands of Afghanistan. I don't think many of us here would want to see that. Please, allow me to take questions then, uh, for, for the speaker, please. Uh, the floor is open. We have uh, approximately 15 minutes. Young lady. Yes. Thank you. Please, please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a, a U.S. military member. And um, in terms of the, the O&M costs, why are those not simply um, part, why do we divide all of our um, funding sources rather than saying, look, here's the project, and this is what the O&M costs are, and it needs to all go together? Well, I, 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 I'm not totally following the question, but um, I don't know. I don't know why we divided that out, uh, why they divide that out. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is more we have turned over um, projects. You see this with roads. You see this with hospitals. Um, it's almost a turnkey. Here's the hospital. But we never asked the question before we gave them the hospital. Can you actually maintain this, either technically, uh, politically, uh, or economically? Uh, we've had so many cases of situations where uh, uh, we design a hospital, maybe this is poor design, uh, with tremendous fuel usage. I think last year we had one where a series of clinics were built to replace old clinics, and it turned out that the O&M, basically fuel cost, would, was like twice the amount of the uh, uh, ministry's budget for that quarter or whatever. I mean, so essentially you would drown, you would, you would suck all the money out of the ministry. I don't know why we're not considering that. That's one of our criticisms. Before you build something, see if the Afghans want it, do they need it, and can they afford it? I mean, that's all we're saying. And uh, to go back to uh, the uh, point, we're, we're firm believers in the mission. And we think our critique, and that's why we're set up, is to point out these problems so hopefully we can do it better. Because if you turn over a building that can't be used, it's not going to help the Afghans. And if anything, it's going to turn them off to, to the foreign aid that's coming, uh, turn them off to the central government. And one of our goals was to ensure a robust central government with the strong support of the uh, uh, the local populace, um, so it doesn't help anybody. And then the third point is, it's just a waste of money. That money could have gone to a better purpose. So that's what it's saying about strategic plan. But I don't have any answer why they don't do that. You know? Yeah. John, you mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, um, Hughes, uh, Board of uh, MEI. John, you mentioned that the 
this disconnect between the budget of the Afghan government, the let's say the eight, let's say round numbers, eight billion, and revenue generation of two billion. And the real answer is, other than the transitional funding of uh, the U.S. government and other countries, this potential of exploiting the extractive natural resources. And when I was in Afghanistan back in 2004 and 5, we fought for months, actually almost a year, to get the actual survey done, which then identified this enormous mineral wealth that they do in fact have. What would you guess is what, what steps have to be taken by the U.S. and by Afghanistan to realize the potential of exploiting these resources? I mean, it's, it's roads, it's energy, very energy intensive industries. Do we, have we put that foundation in place to do that or, or, or is that still way off? Uh, what, what we're finding, and that is the lesson learned, and that's a good question, is, I mean, we haven't made it a high priority really. I mean, we, will, we say it's a priority, and that's what we say is the disconnect. Um, uh, from a strategic point of view, if you want to get this country going, it's got to generate income and generate jobs. Um, you know, that's common sense. Uh, where are the jobs? Uh, Where's the income? Now, this is a great farming community. I mean, they did have done farming, so obviously you want to emphasize that. But for real revenue generation, it is in the extractive area. And for that, you need a laws. You have laws on the book. You need the infrastructure, and you probably need the security to go along with that. And we haven't seen, uh, we haven't seen that. We've seen a lot of people talk about it. I think the, 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 uh, the uh, the most successful work we did was actually doing that analysis of where the resources were, and that was done, uh, I think, with uh, uh, the assistance of, uh, um, I don't know if it was the Department of, uh, I forget which agency actually did it, but they did a very good job. I think it was, NASA. yeah, NASA, and geo, geological surveys, I think, came out. Actually, by the Afghan yeah. Ministry of Finance. Yeah. <laughs> by Ashraf Ghani at this time. Yeah. But that's been the closest we've come. I've been going there for two years now, and I'm a, you know, I haven't been going for that long. I've only been appointed. But every time I've gone there, they've always told me the the new minerals law is about ready to be passed. Mm -hmm. And I'm still waiting. Now, I think it passed one of the, either the lower or higher house. And, and I don't know what's in it yet, but I mean, it may have actually passed. But that's, that's a key. Yeah. Now, who's going to, I mean, I just had a meeting last night with business executives for national security and talked to them. And uh, I've, I've worked uh, with industry a lot when I've been on the Hill and off. I mean, who is going to risk investments in a country that you don't have any statutes on the books? Who's going to really invest money in a country like this where there's a non-existent or a, a banking system that you really don't exactly trust? So you have to build up that confidence. And that's the point we're trying to make here. Uh, Gene Dewey, a former State Department. Could you comment on uh, something that we observed from State in 2002-2003, that the big capital intensive projects like the Kabul Kandahar Road seemed to suck all of the resources out of some of the uh, really useful products that the State put forward, like the Afghan Conservation Corps. Uh, Perhaps the reason was that it's harder to monitor a lot of little projects like the Afghan Conservation Corps, and it makes uh, aid maybe more vulnerable to get excited about those things, and they may feel they're less vulnerable if they just have big projects like the road. What, what is your comment on that? Um, you know, I can't speak uh, from an audit having been done or uh, any official products that we've come out of, anybody's come out with, but, but I, I, I do sympathize with, sympathize with the statement you made because I've heard it from a lot of people in the aid community, in the development community, uh, as well as uh, uh, current and former uh, State Department employees, that sometimes the overemphasis on big projects uh, may be mistaken. We could actually accomplish more with smaller projects. Um, but we haven't done an audit on that. We'll be looking at that as part of our lessons learned uh, uh, series that we're going to be producing. But that's a very good point. I, I've, and I've heard that criticism from everybody. Yes. 
Hi, I'm Cheryl Garner. Um, I worked uh, up so until Jan Cheryl Garner. I worked at, uh, up until January at Shafafiat, uh, ISAF's oh, okay. Counter-Corruption uh, Task Force. And one of the things that you touched on that was a big frustration for us at the task force at the time was the lack of importance placed on counter-corruption efforts uh, by both the IC and or the uh, international community, and then also um, by our own government. So, have you seen any steps to elevate that? You know, in particular, at the time that we were trying to take initiatives uh, to possibly use withholding um, security fund disbursement as a lever to um, get actions out of the Afghan government uh, on the counter-corruption front. Uh, we ran into some resistance from within our own government that said, no, 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 you know, we're working on the bilateral security agreement. We don't want to get things all upset right now. It's, it's never a good time to bring up the ugly issue of corruption uh, with our Afghan counterparts, it seems. So have you seen a, a shift in attitude on that, or have I pretty much captured what the current situation is? Um, yes and no. <laughs> First of all, uh, uh, kudos to you and your team, the, uh, 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 the organization you worked with and Task Force 2010 and others that were set up by the military I think were uh, very effective or as effective as they could be. So you did a, a yeoman's task uh, there uh, looking at contracting, looking at uh, uh, corruption. Um, let me answer the question this way. Um, it, corruption is still a serious problem. Um, I think there is a shift. People are starting to realize how important it is in a place like Afghanistan, and that's not only um, us, the auditor types, the investigators, but I think our uh, uh, policymakers and I think some of the agencies are starting to do that. Uh, there is a movement toward conditionality, uh, but it's still a movement toward. We would like to see, and I have spoken publicly and testified about it, and I'll testify again in another month, about there is a need to do that, and that's what I said today. We have to risk saying no. There has always been this situation, and I've been told this by ambassadors, by generals, by colonels and aid administrators and all that, that uh, counterterrorism or security or whatever always trumps the corruption issue. And that is so frustrating. Um, and many people have spoken saying it doesn't. You are actually making things worse. And I will point you to the testimony of General Allen last week, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you can find it, where he comes out and says that. That was a mistake. And I will also point you to, and I think it's on our website, we have a link to a report that General Dunford commissioned, which came out in February. Uh, it's a fantastic study of the military's role in Afghanistan, and it relates to the problems related to corruption and how the military itself contributed to the corruption problem. So I highly recommend you take a look, and I, I praise General Dunford in uh, prior speeches and, and testimony for actually commissioning this Lessons Learned report. So it's a fascinating. So he has taken your concerns and said, you know, they're right. So let's... That's one thing to talk about the past. I'm here to say when we go forward, we have to keep that in mind. Keep in the lessons learned that Allen has said, that Dunford has said, and others. Uh, uh, Sarah Chase, I know who's, you probably know, who's lived there for years in Afghanistan, is now working at a Carnegie on this whole issue of kleptocracies. She's also written heavily, and a number of people have started to say what you've said. And uh, uh, it's counterproductive. And we have to consider that when we go into a country like Afghanistan about the corruption issue. Is there a self-correcting feature, though, in that we have, we're going to be able to allocate far less money? Well, to some extent that helps because there's less money to steal. But if it's not spent wisely, it's going to go to cronies and corrupt institutions and, again, alienate the people and not accomplish why the taxpayers gave it to Congress to give to the agencies to spend over there. Right. So, uh, the, you know, it, it's not self-correcting by just lowering. If we keep doing the wrong thing, it's sort of like the definition of what's insanity. 
you know, repeating the same thing, assuming you're going to get a different outcome. So you take a billion dollars and you keep doing the same, st you know, wrong thing. You fail. Well, we'll cut it to 500 million and keep doing the same wrong thing. Well, you just fail at a smaller level, you know, but it's still failure. We have to change our thinking and our approach. And that's what I think the, uh, the questioner was alluding to, and I think that's what General Allen and the Dunford Report allude to, that we have to change our approach. So I'm very encouraged by their statements. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, Jerry Stein from the State Department. Um, you know, uh, with Karzai negotiating with the Taliban now and with Al-Qaeda pretty much able to set up bases in other countries, is there anything happening in Afghanistan that makes it worth investing in it anymore? It, is it in our strategic interest to pursue our policy in Afghanistan. I mean, something's going to happen if we stop contributing money. I mean, it'll, it'll turn into something, whatever it is. But yeah. is it worth for us to continue to invest in it? Um, that's a very good question, and I, I don't mean to dodge it, but that's above my pay grade. Um, I don't do policy. IGs don't do policy. We do process. Maybe answer this. Yeah. Are there good things going on? I mean, we've heard oh, yeah, there are good things. I mean, is, is obviously. Oh, so. obviously there's good things going on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but my job isn't to be the cheerleader. If you look at my statute, and I, I, my staff knows this, and there's some here, I call them my Bible. You know, I take the 1978 IG Act, and I take the 87 Act, not the 87, the uh, 2008 Act 2000, uh, that created my uh, uh, organization. And these are my Bibles. This is my brief. And I dare you to look at those two statutes and find anywhere in there it's my responsibility or my job to highlight and be a cheerleader, to highlight successes and to be a cheerleader. I'm interested in successes because part of my job is to advise the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and Head of Aid on what works, so I'd like to look at successes. But it's not my job to be the cheerleader. And this is, I go back to your initial point. You look at aid and state, you were at state, somebody here from DOD, they have public relations staffs that you could balance the budget with if you eliminated them. I have two people. Okay? I got two people in my loud mouth, my big mouth. You know, I, I, I find this humorous in a way that I have people coming up to me saying, well, you've changed the whole attitude toward Afghanistan. My two people and me, my agency of 200 people, um, if there are successes there, aid and DOD and state should be up on the hill and in the press praising them, because I think they should, but it's not my job. I try them to learn from the successes. That's why we sent the letter. You know, I, I, can, I can write the lessons learned report on failure. I'd like to write the lessons learned on failure and success, but no one's giving me any specific successes. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. But I don't mean to dodge it, but I don't do the policy. A policy has been made to go into Afghanistan. It's stated why we're there, and we support that policy. Our job is to try to do it better by exposing the problems, highlighting how to do it better, and hopefully somebody will listen to us. I'm going to take one last question over here. Hello. Sorry, my name is Leanne Rios. I've just returned from Afghanistan where I spent two years uh, working on development. Um, my question is, um, something that I didn't hear you mention much about is capacity development uh, within the Afghanistan context, uh, which is a serious issue. And so I'm just wondering if you can expand upon your view on capacity development um, and how it ties into the lessons learned that you've seen and the way forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, I highlighted four uh, the lessons learned. Obviously, that is a, one we, we definitely have to look at. And there have been some encouraging signs. Uh, and that is part of 
if you're going to build the economy, you have to to build that capacity. If you're going to fight corruption, you have to build that capacity. And there have been some successes. The concern is, and let's take for example, capacity building at the border to uh, handle the customs generation. There has been some technical capacity building. But the question is, when you're dealing with the corruption from above, when you're dealing with what essence is a, a, a vertically integrated criminal enterprise, and you're the poor customs officer who's trying to do the right thing for Afghanistan, and see, this is, let me just back, I mean, that's the difficult. It's not just teaching them how to collect the revenue. You have to go beyond that. And that's the difficulty. And I approach this a little differently. And, and, and uh, the ambassador referred to me because I was a prosecutor. Somebody mentioned I was a oh, prosecutor. No, you did. You know, I approach it as a prosecutor. So I've seen the glass half full and half empty. Maybe I spend too much time on the dark side. But I understand what motivates people to do things. And I think we all do. I've seen a lot. I mean, I used to do organized crime prosecutions in Ohio, Youngstown, and places like that. There are honest cops or honest building inspectors who if somebody shows up and they give them the choice, it's like you heard the line down in Mexico, you either get silver or lead. Well, one way to avoid getting the silver, I don't take the bribe or the lead, the bullet, is to say, he forced me to do it. It was the federal agent who forced me to do it. And that's what's happening on the border. And that's why we allude to the fact when our customs attaches, contractors, leave the border site, those poor Afghan border guards or customs agents can no longer hide behind, it was this US guy that made me collect the revenue, so don't kill me, don't, don't kidnap the family. When we pull those guys out, they have nowhere to hide. And the same applies to the prosecutors, the same applies to the judges, the same applies to the counter-narcotics forces. When we pull back, we leave these people exposed. So that's why answering, it is capacity building, but how do you handle the situation of this vertically integrated corrupt enterprise, the threat after we leave? And I don't have an answer to that. I'm just applying my experience as a prosecutor, my experience on the Hill, and by my human experience. That's why I say it's a critical, if we're closing down bases and revenue generation is important, maybe that should get into the planning process. So don't think in terms of FOBs, forward operating bases, just for military purposes. What I'm saying is maybe somebody should be considering them for other purposes. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, if it does, yeah. we can work on that. You know, you know uh, about a year and a half ago, I was part of an assessment team that was looking at AID programs. And we were naturally, we were interested particularly in capacity building uh, to see whether we could f channel the money through the central government and give them the responsibility. And I think this was one of the points that they made. They said, you've built capacity now. Now let us try. We have to be able to do without your holding our hand. But one of the things that they said to us and which we on the subject of corruption was they said, yes, we have a lot of corruption, but you do too. And I, I said, now what do you, exactly do you mean by that? They said, well, they brought up that very familiar observation. How much of what is allocated actually gets there? How much of it is siphoned off by our contractors? Uh, and uh, they said, that's American corruption. Now, I you know, made the argument, well, you've got to pay them decent salaries and they're going to come out and so on. But uh, this was their response here as well, that we have a job too also to make more efficient our own, the, the way in which we spend money. Uh, and that has to be, I think, a, something which you're not a challenge to do in your reporting, I don't believe. Oh, no, we are. We are. Okay. We, we look at it all reconstruction money. Oh. So uh, that issue about high overheads or where the money is spent is something we've issued a number of reports. Okay, so we, good. We look at so it. you did. Uh, it's just that it had not come up yeah, yeah. Th th this afternoon. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and for the excellent questions. And to our speaker, we greatly, greatly appreciate your being here. Thank you.